am delighted that you have found the Mindset Mentor Meets podcast. I'm Angela Cox, your host and indeed the Mindset Mentor, and I'll be interviewing executives and founders at the top of their game to find out what lies beneath. I want to know what makes people proud, how they define success, what holds them back and indeed what drives them forward. This is authentic and natural conversation with the best in the business. So listen in, enjoy and if you love what you hear, please do leave a review. And now over to today's guest. Welcome to today's podcast. Happy New Year. I am here today with who is known as Dr. Simon Ratcliffe, but to his clients and his friends, he's known as Simon. He is the co owner of Kelpland Veterinary Center, which he runs with his lovely wife, Camilla. He's a husband and also a dad. And one of the cool things about him, I think, is that not only is he a twin, but he's also got another set of twin siblings, which I just think is really cool. He's mad keen on sports and just a genuinely nice fella. Simon, how are you on this glorious day? Very well, thanks, Angela. Thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm well, thank you. I say it's glorious. It's very grey. We're recording this at the beginning of January. <laughs> I don't know whether it's a day for surfing today. You're a mad keen surfer, aren't you, Simon? Yeah, I was looking actually on the forecast because uh, you live down on the south coast. It's actually looking quite nice today for a surf, but. Sadly, COVID has meant we're doing this remotely and I'm stuck in Berkshire, so there's no waves in Berkshire. I know, because your coy plan was to sort of come here, wasn't it, to the office, record this face-to-face, <laughs> and then go for a nice morning and afternoon surfing on the winter. Yeah, it was coming together quite nicely, that, until <laughs> Omicron came along. But there Oh, we go. there we go. So we're on Zoom again, and we haven't actually ever met face-to-face no. yet. We've, been, we've known each other for some time, and we've been working like this. So one day we'll get to me and you'll get to do that surfing on the beach, which will be lovely. (laughs) Now we're going to talk today about your proudest moments. And like most people who come through this process with me, they sort of go away and do the prep for this and go, my God, it's actually quite hard to think about what the proudest moments are. How have you found it as a process? I actually think it's really enjoyable to sit down and think about it. I don't end up thinking about myself very much in day-to-day life. I just kind of get um, taken along with the with the rave. And, you know, I'd encourage everyone to do it, actually. I think it's quite a cool project to do. Well, it'll be interesting to see what you've got for us then, based on that, because you've had a very... Well, I mean, your life has just taken you in lots of different directions because you were the son of a farmer... You've got lots of siblings. You've got this amazing business that you run. You're kind of known as the local hero because you <laughs> save the lives of lots of animals. Look at you now. I'll call that you. may be a little, <laughs> a little bit of an exaggeration, but one thing I should say, actually, because hopefully my siblings will listen to this recording at some point is they'll be offended, but it's not, we're not actually twins and twins, we're twins and triplets. Twins and triplets, um, of course yeah. you are. So, we're a full house. I actually worked with a colleague who was a twin and had twins. And, you know, I was like, well, I see your two pair and I've got a full house. <laughs> so we, me and my twin brother, we're four years older than the triplets. The triplets are two girls and a boy. But yeah, grew up with one of five on a dairy farm. And that was lots of fun. I'm sure that'll come into the discussions today. Well, twins and triplets, it's a rarity, if nothing else. So let's kick off then with the first one. What have you got for me? So it's a bit of a cheesy one, my first proudest moment. But, you know, my wedding day is is one of my top three proudest moments, definitely. I'm a six foot five, (laughs) geeky man. And when I was at school and university, spotty, geeky, not cool at all. And somehow managed to marry a gorgeous very cool lady Camilla and yeah so definitely a very proud moment and it's just fascinating the process of getting married like the obviously the courtship like I I knew her at university but we were just friends Mm -hmm. she was way too cool for me and 
you know, probably knew us for like nine years before we even got together. And then we get married and then and then it's just such a journey life. So we we lived up in the northwest and then it was this big thing, but we're we gonna live in the northwest or in the south. Then we moved south, and then that's the same. The reason we moved south was to buy our business. That was sort of the excuse to to make the move. And then we got two amazing kids, and, mm-hmm. and now we're sort of trying to run this mad business as well as be married, as well as um, <laughs> you know look after two kids. And it, and I'm sure you know lots of people have exactly the same things, but it's you know it's a constant challenge. And and Camilla definitely challenges me in a good way you know, primarily to do with my lifestyle because I, I will easily get sucked into the business. Mm. And some of that's to do with my upbringing, but also just, you know, sort of tunnel vision. I'll just get sucked in like a vortex and she's always trying to, you know, prioritize family time. And that's absolutely right. And if I didn't have her, my life would be a, a million times worse. So definitely one of my top three proudest moments. Whereabouts did you get married? We actually, <laughs> in the spirit of compromise, we got married in a place called Dudley, which is just south of Birmingham, because half the congregation, or, well, it wasn't in a church, but half the guests were in the north and half were in the south. So we just like, <laughs> and meet in the middle. <laughs> yeah, we picked this sort of, I mean, it's a really nice wedding venue in a place called Dunchurch. And yeah, it was a lovely day. It was gorgeous, really hot, you know, lots of dancing and fun and, you know, a great honeymoon and you know it was 2013 so it's a while ago now and you know life just kind of sucks you up and you do forget about these things I was watching four weddings and a funeral over Christmas and that film is just about that process that time in your life when you you do go to a wedding or a stag do every weekend and and that's what we were in then and then suddenly everyone's married you don't go to one for years and and that's sort of where we are now and you almost forget your own wedding day so it's nice doing this to, to sort of think about that and reflect on it yeah yeah, and reflect on the whole time you've been together as well, because you weren't always working together, but now you're running the business together and yeah. you're sort of the vet and leading the practice. And and so what's Camilla's role in the practice? Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, Camilla was a very successful biology teacher before I bought the business. And then I was like, come on, you, you can you know be involved in the family business and that's not what she grew up wanting to do ever, be you know, run a vet practice. But as the business has grown, she's grown within her role. And, you know, we were just discussing recently the aspects of it that we find really frustrating and it's so hard sometimes, but she gets a lot of satisfaction from it as well. And, you know, we're, we're trying to change the management structure and some of that is what does she do and what does her role entail? And it's actually, she wants to do more than I think we both realised. And that, mm. that's interesting and a good thing. So yeah, she definitely would never have thought at school, oh, I'll, I'll run a vet practice one day, <laughs> but she's an integral part of it now. And hopefully she continues to enjoy it and be part of it mm. in the future. And what about you? Was it something that you always wanted to do? Yes, it is actually. I mean, it's kind of, kind of sad. I mean, since I was about 12 or 13, I, I knew yeah. I wanted to be a vet really clearly. So I grew up on a dairy farm and obviously loads of cows and the vets there all the time but we had loads of dogs and cats and chickens and, and everything so the vets were very much part of our lives and I really enjoyed farming but something about it I didn't think was for me when I was at school I really enjoyed science and I was quite good at it and then it, so it's kind of like science plus animals equals being a vet and then when I was 13 I, I went around with the, the local vet in his car for a week I mean, no one does work experience when they're 13. It's so sad. But, um, <laughs> I absolutely loved it. And that, that was it, you know, done. Yeah, and, and that's been it ever since. And, you know, it's, I don't know when I realised I wanted to run my own place, but I guess that was inevitable at some point. Mm. And it's different though, isn't it? You know, there's a passion for wanting to be a vet, but then running a business is a very different skill set. So you're having to combine the two things together and you're building a really successful business because it's growing like crazy, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah, it is. It's extraordinary. I mean, last year, 2021, we grew like 20%, which is insane considering we were locked down for the first quarter of the year. And, you know, it's a veterinary wide thing. Like sadly in COVID, there's been winners and losers and the veterinary profession, definitely a winner in terms of demand, creates its own problems. And that's, Certainly that what Camilla and I have been dealing with is, you know, trying to get the staff right, get enough staff, 
change our facilities. We just renovated our whole building in 2021. And yeah, so it, it's a challenge, but it's mm-hmm. it's all, all good, all positive problems. So that, that's, that's a relief at least. Yeah, nice problems to have. Yeah. <laughs> So a marriage at home and a marriage within the business and, yeah. you know, whilst it might have its challenges, they're positive challenges and you're sort of reflecting on everything that Camilla helps you to be. And yeah, it's really lovely to hear how successful you can be when you are with your partner, basically 24 seven. Yeah. So it's lovely to hear that. Yeah, it's, it, it, I mean, it is interesting. Like my family coming from a farm, the the husband and my mum and dad, you know, they're running the farm and living together. My younger brother, he runs a farm. His wife's on site, and so it's a sort of running theme in the family. Yeah. Interesting with us because the practice isn't our home. The practice, the vet practice, is around the corner. So we're trying to get into better habits, have more discipline about talk about work in work. You know, don't yeah. don't have an argument about moody receptionist whilst you're eating dinner with the kids but it you know it's really hard not to <laughs> so we're trying to have like a Tuesday meeting so this afternoon is the Tuesday meeting but yes it's difficult we went through a phase actually Sunday mornings we would drive Sundays we'd be like right we'll go out with the kids somewhere and on the way we'd have an argument about work so like some annoying staff <laughs> member and it's like this is crazy what are we it's doing? so easy though yeah, isn't it so easy yeah yeah. So it's that kind of husband and wife at home and then yeah. the kind of the people that run the practice at work and yeah. trying not to blur the lines. Yeah. yeah. It's, a good, <laughs> it's a good challenge. I mean, I, yeah. honestly, I don't know whether we'll, it's one of those lifelong challenges. I'm not sure it's one that you're going to pass and, and find some magic formula. But that's what I mean about Camilla. She just challenged me to, mm. you know, it can be better than this. It should be better. You don't have to work all the time. And we were just saying before we started, I, I didn't work for much of December and December ended up being our biggest month in turnover wise <laughs> all year. It's just crazy. There you go. You see, you can just step into the background, get on that beach, go surfing every day <laughs> well, that, and your business kind of will be fine. Went then, yeah, but I enjoy it too much. You see, I, I get a bit bored if I don't get in there very much. I want to find out what's happening to my cases. So yeah, yeah. I'm an addict. I mean, you love it, don't you? You love yeah. doing what you do. So that, that comes through and that'll be the driver. So tell me about your second one. So my second proudest moment was the day I bought my Land Rover Defender. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> this is, it's a good one because, you know, I grew up on the farm, learned to drive a Land Rover Defender. My uncle had one and it was really cool and, and shiny and, and modern. Our one on the farm was, was horrible and crusty, but it was amazing. <laughs> and then... Covered um, in mud. <laughs> yeah. And then when we realized we were going to buy the practice, so this was the same year we got married, 2013, we found out that this practice was for sale in Berkshire. And there's this massive process, obviously, the pre-sale, you're trying to value the business. And we had various consultants and accountants and trying to to value the business. And then at the same time, you're doing fun stuff on the side, such as designing, you know, what would my logo look like and and stuff Uh like that. And when we were doing that, my sister was running um, a print business at the time. And I was like, well, you know, it'd be really cool if I got a Defender. You know, can you put the sign, the logo on the side of the Defender and see what it looks like? And she like mocked it all up. And it was, you know, this grey Lando Defender with Calpolan Vets on the side. You know, and then in 2018, I I got it, a grey Lando (laughs) Defender, and it's got Calpolan Vets on the side. And it's really interesting this process of thinking about your moments because I didn't realize it really at the time. I mean, obviously I had ambitions and goals Mm -hmm. before buying a business, but I didn't write them down or or anything sort of like that. And then when you look back on it, it's sort of a case of manifestation. I I was Totally. That's exactly what I was thinking. And then I got it. And it's fascinating if you've got that focus, even Mm. even almost subconsciously. Mm. It wasn't like every day I I had Land Rover Weekly magazine or (laughs) testing about it. It was just (laughs) in the back of my mind. It fitted sort of the values of my business, Mm. like a little local community vet chugging around in his Defender, going to see cats and dogs at home you know, most of the work is done in the practice so the d- defender is kind of pointless it's yeah, like you don't really need the defender do you no, <laughs> totally ridiculous camilla thinks it's absurd 
she's only been in it once or twice, I think. But I've got a, I've got a kid's seat in the in the passenger seat, so the kids. Well, I can only get one, one kid in, but <laughs> they, they think it's all right. And and now I've, I'm sort of a bit more environmentally minded. I, I feel almost a bit guilty about it, but I I can't really let it go. So I'm a bit stuck there. But just interesting reflecting on yeah. my my personal journey here buying the business and and so on and. That definitely, obviously, was some there as a goal somewhere, and then it happened, and it's really interesting how that can happen. And and I, you know, I literally last weekend in the Sunday papers there was an article about it. Some someone on TikTok has been talking about it or whatever. And I've heard Jim Carrey. There's a there's a thing on YouTube about Jim Carrey, and he like wrote himself checks for fifteen yeah. million dollars or something, and, and when he was a kid, and, and then he did it. And it's interesting, personally what's my next one then because I've, I've achieved that one and it is I think it is interesting it's not essential but it's interesting to have goals and, and ambitions and, mm-hmm. and quite tangible things that are doable and then you know it's, it's interesting that that you can achieve them if, if you if they're there and you want them enough totally and you know you didn't write them down but that idea of the mock-up of the car with the logo on the side before it happened that's almost like the vision board. Yeah. you know idea where you know you're creating a picture that then becomes something that's in your mind that you're working towards subconsciously yeah. and you know what's really lovely though here when you talk about it is that you've had the car now for several years and yet there's still gratitude attached to it yeah because i think one of the challenges with manifestation is quite often people can get to the thing that they were wanting and then when they've got it, it's like not enough. And then they want the next thing and the next thing and the next yeah. thing. And there isn't really a level of satisfaction that's attached to achieving what they've achieved. But you're still there loving this car <laughs> because it represents a lifetime for you. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I guess I, I alluded to myself by saying I, I need another target. And I don't necessarily need one, but it's just interesting to think about it. And I think the thing with the business, our business, it's grown quite a lot, as I've alluded to, but we have limiting factors, namely space. We don't have really any more space. We've just acquired more where we lease our our premises. So the the interesting challenge for us as a business is, you know, we want to find a sweet spot where we're profitable. We have good lifestyle as directors, but also that our staff are happy and stay with us for a long time and it's just like you know would we keep accepting new clients Mm. there has to be an end point you can't just keep taking new work on and what do we want and so it's an interesting process to go through because once you climb the mountain you know what do you do next but yeah you know just 40 last year so it's an interesting stage of life to kind of think what do you want to do? And there's, I, I'm not that crazy. Essentially, when when they started, the website for our practice was Berkshire-Bet. And the reason for that was, I, I think I had some delusion that I was going to buy this one practice and then you know take over Berkshire. That, that was kind of what I thought when I was 32. <laughs> and there's and then, nothing wrong with that as a thought no, process. No, that's true. But it's interesting because that sort of, again, then, then at odds with my ethos as being a small family community yes. practice because it, then if you get other satellites, you, you spread yourself too thin and you have more trouble and more stuff, more worries and so on. And, and so I've realised I don't want that. So we changed the website back to Kelpaland now. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a good problem to have to think what do we want to do in the next stage of it? And also having finished the refurb at the end of last year, I guess that's something for us to think about this year. And there are so many businesses who grow and grow and grow, but then actually as directors aren't in any better of a position. It's just they've got, you know, a bigger empire that's, you know, adding value to more and more people, but not necessarily to them and their lifestyle. Yeah. And you yeah. value free time and the ability to be able to get off and do the sports that you're mad about and all of that. Yeah. So it's that balancing piece, isn't it, between the two? Yeah, that's right. And it comes back to your your core goals like what do you want do you want to do you, do you want or need to earn loads of money or do you want the sort of adoration of loads of practices loads of staff yeah. the, the one thing in my case that is helpful is my clinical interest is surgery on dogs and cats mm-hmm. and the, the more interesting cases and and if you look at it as a caseload so you might have one in a thousand dogs might break their leg 
And those are the cases that are really interesting. So the more patients you have, the more cases, therefore, the more interesting cases. So from a clinical perspective, it's more satisfying, arguably. Yes. But I, you know, I don't know, and it's this is an interesting one for us, is how how big do we want to be? And that's that's not arrogant to say we could be as you know big as whatever, as successful as we want, but it's just that's the next sort of thing for us to assess as directors and work out how much do we want to work, how much money do we need, what what are the sort of levels of debt are we happy with, all those sorts of, of questions. And you know, it's interesting where these conversations go because we started off talking about a Land Rover. And, you know, now we're talking about the mix of the business and and all of these things are connected because it's all about what do you want and how are you going to achieve what you want? And manifestation might play a role in that, but there has to be a lot of thought as well, because I always say stuff doesn't happen by osmosis. You know, we have to make it happen. Yeah. And you made it happen in terms of bringing that car into your life because you've worked hard. Yeah. Yeah, I love it, that. It, yeah, it is cool, and and like say, I'm I am grateful. I do try actually try and be grateful, you know, as a general thing actually, because that's I think that's still important. Like, I'm really grateful that we we grew last year, and very mindful mm-hmm. that lots of people sadly have really struggled. It's yeah, it's pretty mad out there, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, if there's one thing I know about you, Simon. It's that you have this underpinning of humility which I think is one of your massive strengths and, you know, will mean that you always consider the steps that you take carefully and arrogance won't get in the way of it. I'll give you that for free. So (laughs) I'll take it. it. (laughs) (laughs) Number three, then what have you got for me? Yeah. Number three is a harder one to get and it's less of a sort of event or thing as the first two were, but I think it does tie in nicely with obviously this podcast and the title of your podcast which is me me finding the growth mindset i'm proud of myself for doing that because i have understood it just through my own reading really no one's ever really told me about it and when i look back on my life like growing up on the farm it is a quite a brutal environment working mm-hmm. on a farm and the whole point about the growth mindset is you learn from your mistakes and mistakes are okay and you know, that, that's how life goes. On a farm, it doesn't work like that. You make a mistake, you get absolutely bollocks. And, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter if you're 10 or 20 or 30 or 50. And that was just the environment that it was. And, you know, I think all the farms when, when I was growing up, that, that would be the same. My brother might say it's the same now, but I always find it difficult because we were the boss's kids and then we went to school all the time. And then in the holidays, we had to work. And we were on the farm and we didn't really know what we were doing because mm-hmm. we went to school. We, we weren't trained farm laborers. So when we started driving tractors, I was crashing tractors everywhere. My brother was crashing tractors. We were doing massive mistakes all the time. And it's because we'd never really been trained. It was like you were supposed to assume farming, you know, ability. It was in your blood. <laughs> was, yeah, no, it, genuinely, that's how it is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. My, my younger brother, Ian, he is a stockman. He understands animals and, you know, arguably he has a real talent for that. That's not necessarily something you can learn, but, you know, the whole point of the growth mindset is you can learn everything. But mm. yeah, and so the upbringing was in many ways amazing, running around a farm with with four of your friends the whole time and playing loads of sport and, and having loads of freedom, very supportive parents, supported me to, through university and everything. But when you look, back on the work in the farm it it was pretty hardcore and it was fixed mindset it was like you're either good or you're not yes and it would have been very easy for me to have been fixed in many ways in my life I think going to university did open my mind and you meet all the people from different backgrounds and different opinions and and I remember really being exposed to being completely ignorant when I started uni I referred to black people as niggers in a party and was asked, was told to leave. And, and I genuinely had no idea what I'd done wrong, but just, you know, completely ignorant. And, and again, it, there's no fault of my upbringing. That's just the way it was. Now, as an adult, I, I read a lot and I, I've just found the, the stuff about mindset absolutely fascinating. And, and also linking to medicine as well. There's a great book about black box thinking with yeah. Matthew Said and, and, and that compares like how pilots learn from mistakes and, and medics don't. And the, the fascinating thing about medicine is veterinary or human is if you make a mistake and, and your patient dies, 
you know, the stakes are incredibly high. Totally. Is it acceptable for you to make mistakes on your path to improving your own clinical skills? And, and that provides a massive pressure. So in my world, that that's like, you know, we talked about a dog break, it breaks its leg and it's a really bad break. Am I good enough to fix that? Is it acceptable if I make mistakes fixing that on my personal journey, but that dog is then in pain or lame or worse for years? Mm. Or should I refer it to a specialist who does these all day, every day? And so if I refer it, I, I'm not going to grow and improve my own skills. And, and that dilemma is, is happening almost on a weekly basis. So the growth mindset, I, I find absolutely fascinating. But um, it's also a complete uh, relief. Uh, it's so wonderful that the idea that you can learn anything, do anything, you just got to try hard and, and learn and be prepared. But my daughter, we bought her a skateboard for Christmas. And I'm I'm half thinking of doing it. I'm like, this oh, you'd be amazing. amazing. <laughs> well, well, I, but you'd I'm be rubbish to start five. with, oh. and then you'd be amazing. <laughs> and that it's, is the yeah. bit, isn't it, about growth yeah. mindset, where a lot of people aren't prepared to be rubbish at things before yes. they're good at it. And it's that yes. sticky middle part where we're rubbish at it, where we feel people are looking at us, we're being humiliated, we look stupid or whatever the story is, that prevents us from being open to learning anything and yeah. knowing that we can. Yeah, I agree. The thing with skateboarding is I'm like, oh, I really could do without a broken wrist. <laughs> <That's> my, <laughs> only, my only reticence about the growth period of that particular activity. But in essence, the idea that you you know you can learn anything. And, mm-hmm. and when we were growing up, my, my siblings would completely agree we're like Ratcliffe's, you know, that's my saying, Ratcliffe's completely impractical. Mm. And, and it's because we tried to, to screw something to the wall on the farm. No, no one would teach us how to do it. We'd do it once, it would fall down and be like, oh, it was so impractical. Yeah. And that was this fixed thing that we decided. And now I'm like, oh, I just need to watch YouTube and then you can learn how to do yeah. it. And if the shells fall down, it doesn't matter, you just put them up again. To, you know. And it's just like this eye-opening moment and it's really exciting, the thought that, you know, I'm only 40. You could learn whatever you want, whatever yeah. skills you want, whatever, you know, business, anything. If you've got the energy and the time and like you say, the sort of ability to put up with the failure that, mm. that is needed to get there. Yeah. And, you know, listening to you, it's such an interesting world that you live in and, and work in, in terms of the consequences of the mistake, which most of us don't have to put up with every day you know we're not in a position where it's life or death when we go to work every day so you've got that kind of side of it but what I see with most people around fixed and growth mindset is the mistakes that they view as being threatening to their well-being are often so tiny but they appear to be so huge and so damaging based on those stories that we tell ourselves like you've just alluded to And it's that kind of transfer, isn't it, of something that might have happened in a moment in time in the past that then prevents us or we see small things as threatening that don't need to be. And what I'm encouraged by hearing you speak is the fact that you said you found growth mindset and we have to find it because none of us are born with it. So it's a decision that we make. And I'm sure you probably find that it's something that you have to commit to daily to keep reminding yourself that, you know, it is okay to make a mistake and it is okay to try something new and be rubbish at it and try it again, because it's not something that's inherently built in us. Yeah. I guess the two levels to it for me, one was learning about it. And then the other was the realization that it applies to everything. (laughs) And it's not like you are Simon is growth mindset and someone else is fixed. It's like every day you could do something like we went to a holiday cottage for the weekend and my friend that was there, I was making poached eggs and he's like, I can't make poached eggs. And I was just like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, just learn. <laughs> and, you know, it's just, and I, I, we ended up going for a walk and the poor guy, I was boring him about the, <laughs> the growth mindset afterwards. But, you know, that's the thing Like you could, in any aspect, you can, you can learn it. But, and, and then when, if you realise that, it's like, wow, you know, everything's on the table suddenly. Quite exciting. So I can't make poached eggs. You know, questions in my mind, is that because you've never made one before? Or is that because you made one once and made a mess of it and someone yes. said to you, oh, that's rubbish? 
or you said to yourself, that's rubbish. And you can, we kind of put the shutters up, don't yeah. we, based on one experience or even worse, based on having never experienced it yeah, before. Yeah, that's right. I love that example because it's so simple, <laughs> but so true. <laughs> yeah. Love yeah. that. So we've got being married and having this amazing relationship with Camilla that is more than you two as husband and wife, as mom and dad, but also you two as partners in this growing business. And then we've got that whole idea of being able to manifest the things that you have started to dream about when you were a little boy and then you've made those happen. And we got into that conversation about goals and how you can work towards things. And then this final one around growth mindset and really putting the energy into believing that you can learn anything and actually starting to see that through. So three completely different themes there in terms of kind of things that you are proud of that make you the man that you are. So if we were reflecting on all of that and then, you know, thinking about everything that you've achieved, if you were going to define the secret to success, how would you do that in a few words? Well, again, it's another great question. And I think I would split it a bit and say, my understanding of business success in my personal experience is you just work really hard, ideally targeted work, not sort of random, but you know, as targeted as possible towards your goals and values. But if you work really hard towards your goals and values, you will be successful as long as you're prepared to take a few bumps in the road and, you know, have disappointments and, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I'm aware having that perspective that, again, I try and be humble and realise I've been lucky in many ways and, you know, you need luck as well. But I think the thing that I struggle with in terms of am I successful is is finding this balance. And the balance with my personal life, I don't think I've found the key to that. And I think that's almost the phase that I'm working on now is how do I manage the business, you know, as efficiently as a family as we can? And how do we, you know, live the family life and have our health and, and all that kind of stuff? Mm. And so I don't feel I found the secret to that. And that that's our next challenge. So that's interesting, isn't it? Because what comes to my mind there is that definition of working really hard. If that defines success in the business, working really hard could be detracting from that personal element that you don't feel you've cracked yet so how can you get a really strong definition around working really hard and actually does that equate to hours worked in the business or can that be found another way so that when you do take time out and go and spend time with family you're not feeling that that's taking you away from what you believe the definition of business success is that's fascinating yeah I think I'm guilty of working really hard in terms of hours spent and being quite loose in terms of my direction. So I, I'll do five things at the same time. I'll check my emails to find that email that I needed to do that piece of work and I mm. get distracted by a new email that's come in because that's more interesting than the work that I need to do. So I'm not <laughs> as disciplined as I should be. And yeah, and, and I think because of that, I'm, you know, I could be more efficient. And then if I was more efficient, I could work equally hard in less time and have more family time. And so thinking about that question, you know, provides some potential avenues mm. to explore. And again, I, I'm not sure that there's a magic pill there, but it's certainly a good one and a privileged thing to be like, okay, mm. well, the business is going well. I've got my land over. Um, <laughs> how I, can I just slot off what, and go to the I beach? Do less work now? <laughs> <laughs> That's the next step. <laughs> what we need is a series of experiments now, isn't it? Get back into black box thinking. I'm just going to experiment with taking a week off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See how I feel about working really hard. <laughs> yeah. I love that. But I love that as an ethos, that idea that if you work really hard towards a set of goals that are underpinned by your values, then actually you can achieve success. And, you know, on a piece of paper, that makes total sense. So it's that idea, again, that it's not going to happen through osmosis and luck might play a part, but you've got to put the effort in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just doing all this sort of stuff, like I love listening to podcasts at like your podcast and, you know, just listen to successful people in other fields and 
you know, it seems to be a fairly continuous story. And I think when I was a kid, I, you know, you'd, you'd listen to like a band come out and do an amazing single as their first single. You'd be like, wow, they're so talented. But no, they've just spent the last 10 years in their bedroom trying to learn how to play the guitar. That, that's what you don't see. And it's just all about <laughs> that. Yeah, artwork. that 10 year overnight success. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you've definitely put the work in because you don't get to become a vet. Without doing the graft no, uh, right. at uni. So, yeah, you're very humble about that, but we know that you've earned it. It's been an absolute joy. I wish you and Camilla and your lovely family every success. And we'll be putting this out, and I'm sure it'll inspire lots of people because you might not work in a leadership position in a corporate organization like many people that come on the podcast, but being able to see how you apply leadership and how you apply it to your own personal success in a different way to perhaps they do is really inspiring. So thank you for coming on and sharing. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been great fun. Thank you very much. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of your day and I'll speak to you soon. All right. Thank you. Take care. And so just like that, we're at the end of the podcast. I hope you've enjoyed your time listening today. And a big thank you from me for taking the time. I'd really love it if you would be able to leave a review because it really does help us to get noticed. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe and then you never miss an episode. I wish you a lovely rest of the day, whatever it is that you're doing. And I hope that you stay safe and well.